Pierce Tower, 46 stories of geometric brilliance. I think it ranks with the best. The Woolworth Building, the Chrysler Building, the Empire State. Treasures of New York, Hearst Tower gives you a look inside this media empire. This is Good Housekeeping's famous test kitchen. And top to bottom, you get an exclusive tour of this Manhattan masterpiece, known for its innovations. Hearst Tower really was groundbreaking. It's a green office building. And its architectural statement. It tries to be very much a part of New York, but at the same time does this balancing act in terms of having its own identity. There's only one Hearst. This program is made possible by the Cheryl and Philip Milstein family and the Metropolitan Media Fund. And now, Treasures of New York, Hearst Tower with Paula Zahn. Standing in the atrium of Hearst Tower, it's easy to see why this building is viewed by many as one of the most important new skyscrapers on the New York City skyline in the last 30 years. On the one hand, it embraces the past, and on the other hand, it clearly signals the future, as you'll see in Treasures of New York, Hearst Tower. It is enough to take your breath away, the skyline of Manhattan. And the gem-like Hearst Tower is a shimmering addition that captures the eye in a flash of glass and steel. 46 stories of modernism, shooting out of the original 1928 Art Deco base in one sleek architectural masterpiece. A very simple statement of a tower balanced on a base. It's a dialogue between the past and the present. Hearst Corporation dates back to the 1800s when the legendary and often controversial William Randolph Hearst took over the family's publishing business in San Francisco and in 1895 decided to expand. His target? New York, the toughest newspaper town in the country. Hearst bought the New York Journal and went on to acquire a chain of newspapers and to modernize newspaper publishing with the introduction of color printing, comic syndication, and news services. Potter grows the fire as the palatial and greatest airship ever built is reduced to a red hot skeleton. In the early 1900s, the media mogul, known in part for his sensational style of journalism and his flamboyant lifestyle, expanded his empire to magazines, including Cosmopolitan, Good Housekeeping, and Harper's Bazaar. He was a great innovator and would not accept the status quo in anything. Frank Benick has spent more than 50 years of his career at Hearst Corporation applying the same approach. I was always inspired that he was never going to be satisfied to stay where you are today, and I've kind of let that guide me. Today, Benick is in his second stint as CEO of the privately held company and also serves as vice chairman of the board of directors. With everything that we've done in the 100 now 125-year history of this company, I can't think of anything that's brought more attention or notability to this company than this building. At the height of William Randolph Hearst's success, he had a plan to create Hearst Plaza in the Columbus Circle area to rival Times Square and Park Row. The Hearst International Magazine building, built in 1928, by theatrical designer and architect Joseph Urban is the only survivor of that grand plan. The Art Deco building made of yellowish cast stone was built with fortifications and fluted columns in anticipation of adding a tower at a later date. He made provisions in the plans at that time for adding a tower. It would not have been the kind of tower that we're looking at today. But nonetheless, uh, he envisioned uh, the growth of media in this neighborhood of New York and uh, his own building uh, expanding in, in later years. But the year after the building opened, that expansion plan was stopped cold as the country plunged into the Great Depression. What was more satisfactory to you? 1928? in the inflation period are the dismal years of deflation. 
Over the next almost three quarters of a century, the idea of the tower was revisited by Hearst executives several times. But as the country engaged in one world war after another, the right circumstances didn't present themselves until well into Bennock's reign. And then there came a time uh, in the 90s when the company was doing well. We were in a position to afford a new headquarters building. We needed it. Bennock tapped Gilbert Moore, a director of Hearst Corporation, to head up an architecture search committee. Moore narrowed the field to architects who had won the Pritzker Prize, often called the Nobel Prize of Architecture. We were interested in those Pritzker winners who had pretty good credentials in reconstructive architecture, meaning taking old buildings and adding to them. Norman Foster absolutely stood out from the crowd. Pritzker Prize-winning architect Norman Foster, known for his daring approach to marrying the old and the new, like Berlin's Reichstag and London's British Museum. Hearst Tower would be Foster's first skyscraper in the United States. I think the opportunity to do a tall building, even a relatively low tall building in Manhattan, which is so synonymous with skyscrapers, with urbanity, just tremendously exciting prospect for any architect. He was an ideal choice for uh, the Hearst Building. Paul Goldberger is the Pulitzer Prize-winning architecture critic at The New Yorker and the author of a number of books, including Why Architecture Matters. The biggest problem the Hearst Building presented to an architect is how do you deal with that bottom? And that bottom, whether you love it or hate it, uh, it's a very strong presence. Do you lie down and play dead in front of it, or do you respond with a kind of strength of your own? Foster responded with great strength of his own, but, it, but in a different way than the original building, and it works. Everybody assumed that the base of the building, which was six stories of 1920s accommodation, in other words, the ceilings were very low, it would be really substandard office space. When I came up with the idea of scooping all that out and creating a, a community focus, everybody said, you'll never do that in New York. My convincing everybody that that was a desirable direction to go in, architecturally, visually, aesthetically, uh, that I think was a pivotal decision. Another crucial design element was the building's exterior structure. Foster proposed covering the facade with what is called a diagram, a diagonal grid of trusses made up of a series of four-story high interlocking triangles that would support the tower. If you look to the Hudson River side of this building, you will see that we have a building right behind it. The problem with that is, is that it blocks your view. So what Norman did was to move the elevator core to the back of the building. Now, when you move it to the back of the building, you have destabilized the engineering of it in a way that you have to compensate for. So this made the diagrid structure, the Buckminster Fuller-inspired structure, uh, absolutely the right thing for this building, organically correct, because it transferred all of the structural strength from the center of the building to the exterior. It became an exoskeleton that was holding the building up. The sturdy diagrid design would make it the first New York City skyscraper without vertical beams. You notice the diagrid, the geometry. That's very, very efficient. It means we can use 20% less steel. That's a lot of tons of steel. It's also more efficient in the way that it distributes the load. And in its appearance, it's quite unique. The diagrid also embodies the environmentally conscious approach that Foster proposed for the entire project. 90% of the tower steel contains recycled materials. And from design through construction, furnishing and operation, Foster hoped to bring his focus on sustainability to the New York City skyline. For as long as I can remember as an architect, I've always been interested in issues of sustainability. 
In addition to the structurally efficient exterior, the roof was designed to collect rainwater that would be used for the air conditioning system and for one of Hearst Tower's signature art features. Icefall would be a two-story sculpted waterfall cascading on both sides of the diagonal escalator. It would not only be stunning, but would also serve an environmental function by humidifying and cooling parts of the building. It was time to present the groundbreaking plans to the Hearst Board for final approval. Foster and Bennick, along with other executives, scheduled one last session together the day before the board meeting. The date of that final planning session, September 11th, 2001. There has been an explosion at the World Trade Center. We heard about this unbelievable event going on downtown. There is smoke coming from the tower on the northern side of the northern tower. In Frank's uh, conference room at the time, we had a big television set and we turned it on. And it involves an apparent accident involving an airplane of some type. And we heard and saw what was what was happening. Now we're getting reports that, in fact, a second airplane has crashed into the other tower at the World Trade Center. We were all overpowered uh, emotionally, obviously, by the events of the day. The last thing anybody in the world wanted to talk about then was building a tower in New York City after what had happened to the Twin Towers. The critical Hearst board meeting scheduled for September 12, 2001, was canceled. Once again, as had been the case almost 75 years before, world events put the building of the tower at risk. At that point in time, if you had asked us, what are the chances that you're going to build this tower, we probably wouldn't have given you too high an odds that we were going to do that. Although we were committed to this city and it didn't take us long to pull our emotions together and decide, look, this is important. This is where we live. This is the headquarters of this company. This city needs this boost. We're going to be here. In October 2001, the Hearst Board made the decision to greenlight the first major construction project in New York City after 9-11. Hearst's decision to go ahead with this building right after 9-11 was an incredibly important symbol. But before construction on the tower could begin, there was still one more major hurdle. The original six-story Art Deco building had been designated an historic landmark in 1988. That meant the tower he wanted to build on top of the existing base would require approval from the Landmarks Preservation Commission. When I was Landmarks Commissioner for New York City, Gil Nora came to see me. Hunter College President Jennifer Rabb headed up the Landmarks Preservation Commission when Hearst first decided to go forward with the tower. It's hard to change a landmark in New York City in the sense of people getting used to that concept and you really need to make people feel comfortable, it's appropriate. And sometimes fine architecture really helps you get over that line. In the fall of 2001, when the Hearst Tower design was presented to the Landmarks Preservation Commission, the commission made the unprecedented decision of unanimously approving Norman Foster's plan. There was a round of applause at the end of the presentation. I assumed that that was, uh, that was normal. It was only afterwards that uh, I gathered it was somewhat different. Two and a half years after 9-11, and after the tower plan was given the go-ahead, Hearst broke ground, and in 2004, construction began. It took more than a year to build the tower framework and to top out the 46-story building. On the exterior of the building, to create the diagrid made of stainless steel cladding, a custom two-tier monorail scaffold had to be built that could move side to side and up and down. Installing the more than 3,000 windows was like putting together a complicated puzzle. On any given floor, there are up to 12 different window configurations, and the window corners slant inward, forming eight-story high 
birds' mouths. Washing those windows also required a custom-built scaffold. The job is not for the faint of heart. While the roof was off, the atrium's diagonal escalator had to be hoisted into the gutted interior. The 58-foot-long escalator was made in one piece and sat protected by plywood for more than a year before it was installed. In 2006, five years after the building was ceremoniously given the go-ahead, the tower was finished. When Hearst Tower opened in 2006, it redefined the modern skyscraper and pioneered a sustainable architectural vision for the 21st century. It is New York City's first occupied office building to receive both a LEED Gold rating for new construction and LEED Platinum status for an existing building, the highest possible rating from the U.S. Green Building Council. Lou Nowickis was project manager for the design and construction of Hearst's new global headquarters. The building was designed to be about 24% more efficient than the baseline approved energy code model for a New York City building. That says something. What says more is that year after year, we have achieved significant reductions in energy each year. The building now uses less energy than when it first opened, in part because of how the interior was designed. The most dramatic sustainable feature is front and center the minute one enters the lobby. The first thing you see when you walk in is ice fall, and that's our water feature. It's 50 tons of glass. What's really unique about this feature, other than the fact that it's beautiful, Water is all rainwater. It is collected into a 14,000 gallon tank in the basement. When visitors come to Hearst Tower, unless they're on a guided tour, the lobby is as far as they can venture. Hearst Tower is not open to the public. But top to bottom, we have an exclusive personal tour of the world famous building. As you come up the escalator, you see all the diagrids that rise and support the whole tower. And if you look along the outside walls, you see all the old windows from the original Hearst Magazine building. You also see the big open space that's created on the third floor, which really is the center of it all. Above the atrium, floors 10 to 45 house offices for the Hearst Seven Media Groups, most of the company's magazine employees, as well as maintenance operations for the 46-story skyscraper. And a ride to the top is a unique experience. These are called destination-based elevator systems. You tell the elevator where you want to go, and I'll say I want to go to the 44th floor, and it will tell me what letter car to go to. What this does is it groups people to like floors and allows the elevator to make as least amount of stops as possible. Hearst is one of America's largest diversified media and information companies and has more than 300 international editions of its magazines, as well as interests in newspaper and business publishing, cable networks, television, radio, internet, and real estate. While each has its own identity, most have the same basic floor plan and same attention to detail to create an environmentally sustainable workplace. In the typical office environment we're on right now green aspects are all around us from the carpet tile to the ceiling tile all materials have a certain amount of recycled content and are recyclable and the lighting is high efficiency the interior areas are free from pillars and walls creating one mile of glass office fronts what i like about the building is that i feel it was designed with people's actual lives in mind joanna coles is editor-in-chief of marie claire magazine and also appears as a mentor on Lifetime's Project Runway All-Stars. This is the Marie Claire floor. It's split between advertising and editorial, which I'm responsible for. And probably my favorite room on the entire floor is the fashion closet, which is this way. We always have three or four, maybe more, shoots going on at a time. So we bring the clothes in here, they get sorted. We have a team of interns who are working on it and then we're laying specific 
uh, looks out and teaming them, uh, teaming the clothes together on the floor. So it gives us plenty of space to do that. I like being able to see the whole magazine up on the wall. And in the art room, we have the facility to do that. We have our board where we put pages up. Once a page is designed, it comes and it's put on the wall up here. So you get a sense of the flow of, of what looks right. And then this is where we start playing with, well, what if we move this story and, you know, we put this story where this story would be so we can just take them off and then see if we like the look of doing that. The cubicles stretch all the way down the office. And the thing that is really interesting, I think, is that it's a completely non-hierarchical layout. So yes, there are offices, my office is in the middle, but the sort of money shop, which is the corner views, are really public space. While the majority of the floors mirror Marie Claire, there is one floor in the building unlike any other. On the 29th floor is the renowned Good Housekeeping Research Institute. The Good Housekeeping Research Institute was founded in 1900, 15 years after Good Housekeeping magazine was launched. Miriam Arend is director of Good Housekeeping Research Institute and serves as the editorial link between the Institute and Good Housekeeping magazine. They started the Institute, which was originally called the Experiment Station, to start testing products that were new on the market. This was right after the invention of electricity. There were all these new household appliances. And the goal was to help homemakers solve problems and tell them what worked best and what didn't. The Good Housing Seal was launched in 1909 and means that if you buy a product that becomes defective within two years of purchase, we will either replace the product or refund your money. This is our beauty lab. It's staffed by chemists and biologists, and we test all types of beauty products, and we have state-of-the-art lab equipment. This is a hair swatch washing station. We use hair swatches when we're testing, shampoos, conditioners, hair dye. So this is something that, you know, certainly no other women's magazine has the capability of doing. We have real data to show what works and what doesn't. This is our textiles lab. Over here, we have a climate-controlled room. So this is our abrasion machine. And what this does is tell us which fabrics are most likely to pill. This is important uh, for sweaters. It's important for all kinds of clothing, for bathing suits. If you want to know if a bathing suit is going to pill when you sit at the side of a pool, this machine can tell us. This is Good Housekeeping's famous test kitchen. We have a triple test promise in every issue of Good Housekeeping magazine. And the truth is, we often test a recipe even more than three times. But at the very least, we're testing each recipe on a gas range, on an electric range, and we're testing it using various brands of ingredients. In addition to the test kitchen, there are six labs at the Institute run by chemists, engineers, nutritionists, and other scientists. And every year, about 5,000 products carry the Good Housekeeping seal. Many others don't pass to muster. It's all part of the consumer advocacy commitment of this more than 100-year-old women's magazine located right here since the original building opened. This is the original Good Housekeeping living room and dining room. As you can see, it's very different from a modern sleek lab facility. Uh, it was very important to everybody at Hearst to preserve this living room and dining room because so many famous people, celebrities, presidents have been visitors here. It's all part of Hearst Corporation's more than 100-year history as a global media giant. And there is no more visual symbol of that than Hearst Tower. It expresses the mood and the aspirations of the Hearst Corporation with our feet firmly planted in our past, our heart in the present with our people, but our eyes on the future. The Hearst Tower is, to my mind, the best skyscraper built in New York in certainly the last uh, 20 or 30 years, and it's very visible. I think there is a sense of occasion. Um, there's, a, there's a certain sense of drama, a sense of place. There is no way you could not be thrilled with the outcome. I have an apartment that has a view of this building, and every morning I would watch it go up. I would watch it out my window. I think that's something that 
I have something to do with. You don't expect that you're going to influence the skyline of New York City, the greatest city in the world. By many estimations, Hearst Tower is truly a 21st century architectural icon. And while no one knows for sure, everyone suspects that William Randolph Hearst would have loved how his vision for this building was finally realized. I'm Paula Zahn. Thanks for watching Treasures of New York, Hearst Tower. This program was made possible by the Cheryl and Philip Milstein family and the Metropolitan Media Fund.